Welcome everybody to this sort of technical showcase. It's a bit of a trial. This is the first technical showcase we've done as, as YPAC. And today I've worked with Matt, Doug and Pete at uh, Vague Control Systems to talk to you about their new offering, which it's important in the UK because in the UK, we're doing a lot of work around monitoring of overflows, monitoring of wastewater coming into wastewater treatment works, and looking at how we're managing flow through the wastewater treatment system. Uh, we've got to stop thinking about the treatment network and the, and the treatment works as separate systems. They are one part of the same system. And really, going forward, we're going to see a lot more monitoring. The current technologies we've got are great, and it's great to see what those who know me, I used to be an MSERTS manager at a water company. I always thought of it, we need several technologies to cover a particular area because there are different applications that we have on wastewater treatment works, different applications we have it in the wastewater system. And it's great to see the technology develop. I remember meeting both, uh, both Matt and Doug and Pete on site uh, back in 2016 when they were bringing out the uh, W61 radar device and getting that certified. And at the time I said, Matt, you've got a great instrument, but really the challenge is at the minute I can buy ultrasonic equipment a lot cheaper and it'll do the same job. I said, prove to me why I'd buy a radar because at the minute I'm paying a lot more money to do the same job. And actually I'm really pleased because Matt and the whole team at Vega, Doug and the whole team at Vega took that on board quite a lot and they've worked really hard over the years. And what they've brought up is what we're gonna see today, which is something that's it's about the same price as an ultrasonic system, um, more or less. But actually, you've got that benefit of radar. You've got that longer, longer um, distance you can measure over. And some great technology. So at that, I'm going to stop waffling. I'm going to stop rambling on. I'm going to ha hand over to Matt and Pete to give us a bit of introduction to their new premises, their, their new offices, their new training room. And uh, tell us all about their, their new device. Oliver, uh, thank you very much for the introduction and thank you everyone for being able to join us. Uh, Peter and I are certainly delighted uh, to be hosting uh, this product launch for you today. Um, to be honest, we wanted to try and do something that was informative, enjoyable and a little bit different. Um, so to try and get um, the message across from, from this launch today, we've actually pre-recorded a couple of videos that we're gonna get played in just one moment. Uh, once they're finished, Peter and I will be back here with Oliver live so that we can do a Q and A at the end. Um, hopefully you find it interesting, informative. Uh, so without any further ado, let's get on and see these videos. Welcome to Meteor House, the new uh, head office and training facility for Vega here in the UK, situated down on the edge of the Ashdown Forest in Sussex. This is not just our head office, but it's a fantastic training facility for us to bring our customers to. So maybe you'd like to follow me through to our training suite to see what we've got on offer in there. So this is our new training suite. We're still getting things settled down, but as the world's largest manufacturer of radar level products, as you'd imagine, we have got radars on pretty much everything. We've got a range of solids applications. Here we've got a mock-up of a chemical reactor with moving agitator blades. We've got a radar of our process radars mounted on a long nozzle with an isolation valve. Similar type of thing that you'd get with a digester type application. Here we've got another one, another application with moving water. This is to try and simulate the CSO with an overfill, uh, 
Um, on the controller here, you can see we've actually got a colour changing screen depending on its um, status, whether it's green, amber, or red, whether it's spilling, with also totalised flow and that sort of thing going on. So, lots and lots of different training models to work with. Down at this end, we've actually got a range of new low cost pressure transmitters, pressure switches, um, small impedance switches, all with Bluetooth built in, really, really cost effective um, instrumentation for those lower demand applications, but where you're still looking for real high end quality. So, this would be a fantastic place for us to have you come and join us. Hopefully later this year we're going to do a training seminar for the water industry to keep your eyes peeled for the details. And if you follow me through into here, this is one of our new training suites. Where actually, we've set it up as a bit of a studio. So this is a fantastic opportunity for us now to run through a few of the new features available with the new MCERT Class 1 system that we're talking to you about today, but also some of the benefits that these systems bring as well. So we often talk about smart, reliable and versatile instrumentation. And we are delighted to say that we now have the performance and accuracy stamp of MCERT Class 1. But you might be thinking, what's so unique about these products that we're launching to the market? And that's why we want to cover five new features for MCERT that we offer, uh, think offer real benefits for those installing, maintaining and operating these systems. So first of all, we've got class one performance in all conditions. Um, people might have heard Vega talking very passionately about radar and about flow um, for level. Um, that's because of the resilience of the me measurement technology and how reliable it is in changing environmental and process conditions. So we're unaffected by changes of air temperature, for example. So we don't have to try and protect the radar head with sun hats or with submersion shields. Um, we're unaffected in our measurement reliability when it comes to build-up and condensation and changing it, uh, weather conditions like strong winds. Um, and also we're unaffected by gases that might build up in the vapour space. So some of these channels might be um, covered for odour control, for example, and you get build up of gas. We haven't got to have any con uh, concerns over the accuracy or quality of our measurement in all of these different changing conditions. So when it comes to installing the device, you don't have to be concerned about sunlight and direct sunlight uh, and having any uh, worries about solar gain, we can maintain very accurate level measurement in all of these different changing conditions. Secondly, we've got class one over a five meter measuring range. So you've got complete flexibility in where you mount the radar. So you really wanna put it somewhere that's very accessible, not just when you install it, but, but, but for those that come to it at a later date and need to, need to verify the accuracy of the system. So some of these channels might be below ground or in difficult or dangerous uh, locations to access. You don't have to jeopardise somebody's safety when it comes to some kind of confined entry. As I say, not just for the installation, but for verifying at a later stage. Simpler installations in a safer location. This inherently gives a quicker and more cost effective installation and site visit when it comes to install or verifying at a later date. We really believe mount the radar where you want to, not necessarily where you have to, close uh, down in the channel um, to maintain the accuracy. So a lot of different um, safety uh, and installation benefits with that five meter measuring range. Thirdly, we've got Bluetooth communication. It comes as standard with all our radars and controls we're talking about today. We believe this offers a safe, quick and simple way uh, of connecting to these devices that is also secure. So we have a six digit pairing code that we use to connect to the device, which is completely encrypted. You then have an additional six digit pin number for locking down any parameter changes. So for those that you want to be able to see but don't touch, uh, you've got complete control over that. Um, we've also got up there easy verification. So um, in part of the um, UMON3 draft product standards, they talk about having a way of 
confirming the sensor status in relation to the spill point to the storm tanks. And they mentioned that this doesn't necessarily have to be with a physical display that's installed in hardware. It could be done through an app, for example. So the free Vega Tools app that you can download to any iOS or Android device offers a fantastic place to be able to do that. We believe in distance and convenient setup and diagnostics that you can do from a safe location. The, the, the app is really interactive. It's got some fantastic drop down menus and setup wizards. So it's a really interactive way of being able to set these devices up the right way first time round. Fourth, we've got class one standalone from the transmitter. So if you don't need the functionality of a box on the wall to get your flow measurement, you don't now have to have it. So the, the radar head is smart. Uh, it has a 32 point linearization curve built in a standard for you to get that flow uh, curve straight from the radar head. So you can have a two wire loop powered uh, device in the field feeding back into any analog or heart input that you've got. So this is fantastic for remote locations, again, maybe UMON 3 style, uh, new MSERTS measurement points that are needed. Uh, it gives complete flexibility for battery power telemetry systems or going into any PLC or, or SCADA system. If you had a, a control on a wall, you would have to install uh, additional mains power and we really think this gives uh, the user complete flexibility on purchasing and transporting to site the kit that they really need. Uh, why have unnecessary installation time or costs added for something that you're not utilising? So it's doing your bit for the environment as well by installing uh, what we believe is the hardware that you really, really need. And the fifth point that we wanted to cover today is where you do need to have functionality from a controller, which obviously there are many applications. We have single and dual uh, channel controllers for you to choose from. So you can combine the radars and the controllers as you see fit. So we give local displays and alarm points, retransmission to your telemetry system, totalizers. In terms of data logging, we, we offer an eight gigabyte SD card, so if you um, data log at one minute intervals, that gives you 180 days worth of data, which is just under six months. So a fantastic amount of storage space. We also have a nice feature of color changing displays. We've got a couple of examples here. Um, so as that flow increases, people that are on site can quickly and clearly see where that flow is in relation to the status operating points that they've calibrated in. So it's just another nice feature for the device. And in particular, um, as the need for the new um, and more MSERPs locations comes up, you can feed different um, applications into one controller. So if you've got uh, a spill point to the storm tanks on the same site where you want to me measure your open channel flow, for example, you can now do that into one controller. So it gives you the complete choice of what you're installing. So if you've got your open channel flow, you might select a radar that has a cable outlet, where you've got your double-sided weir here to the storm tanks, you might select a slightly different radar that has a display built in. And these two radars can feed back in to one controller, forming a complete MSERTS class one system, utilizing the functionality and really maximizing on, on the kit and the performance that it can offer. So to summarize, unique MSERTS class one solutions. Unrivaled performance um, without having to try and protect the instrument from the environment. We don't need to add temperature or other measuring heads to maintain an accuracy from environmental conditions. We're unaffected because we're using radar technology. Class one over a five meter measuring range offering some installation um, and safety benefits that you're not getting from systems that have a shorter um, certified range. So some fantastic benefits there. When you don't need to use the functionality of a controller, it's a smart radar transmitter that can give you your flow data directly from the head. Perfect for UMON3 or remote applications, especially if you're using battery powered telemetry systems. 
Bluetooth communication, so you can see this radar in the front here with a cable outlet, no display, but you can use an app, a free app on your phone or tablet to carry out a really interactive setup on that device, make sure it's calibrated correctly for the application. And number five, dual channel controller options for sites with multiple MSERT measurement requirements uh, spill point to storm tanks and open channel flow, for example, can all feed into one really, really neat solution. So hopefully that's given you a bit of an insight to the five features we believe that these MSERT systems offer that you do currently don't have in the market. We'd just like to finish off by saying a thank you to the partners that we've worked together with over the last year. Um, obviously everyone's been under a bit of pressure with um, COVID as it's gone on. So we really appreciate the hard work that people have put into that. And we really appreciate the opportunity of being uh, innovative and offering now a radar that is smart and can give you your linearized flow data without the need of a controller if you don't need the functionality. So without further ado, I'm going to move on to a short interview. I managed to grab Peter Devine, our technical manager, who was heavily involved in the MSERTS process this time around, but also a number of years ago when we went through it the first time, and just get a bit of a, an insider's view to how he interacted with our partners and how he felt the process went. Good afternoon, Peter. How are you? Hi, Matt. How you doing? I'm good. Good to see you. You too. Um, as you know, I was quite keen uh, to catch up with you and ask you a few questions about inserts, if that's yeah. all right with you. Yeah, absolutely. Good. I'm glad you said that. Um, I think it'd be good to start things off and, and sort of find out who has been instrumental in helping us achieve uh, MCERT certification with these products. Absolutely. Well, yeah, Matt, it's been a great team effort, as you know. Um, in the UK, uh, the technical department have coordinated the process. Um, but, you know, we've had superb support from our colleagues at the factory in the Black Forest of Germany, uh, you know, from product management, uh, the certification department, and of course, the quality assurance department who carried out many of the tests uh, that are required for, for MSERT certification, you know. To share the load, you know, some of the testing was carried out here in the UK, but our colleagues in the factory uh, have been brilliant. Um, also, um, CSA group testing, as you know, they're appointed to do the MSERT certification on behalf of the Environment Agency. Uh, so it was important to engage with them fully throughout this whole process. You know, from the initial concept of standalone radar sensors for open channel flow with optional controllers, through to completion and certification. You know, we liaise with them all the way. Yeah, as you say, quite a few different companies that are involved and must have been a bit of a juggling act in the current climate yeah. that we, we find ourselves in. Indeed, but yeah, indeed. Challenging at times, but great bringing so many uh, companies together. Um, yeah. But this isn't the first time that we've put radar, a radar system through MSERTS, is it? No, that's right. You know, we, we put the first radar through MSERT certification back in 2016. Uh, so wow. yes, we, we have some experience. Feels like it was only yesterday, Peter. Um, <laughs> but um, you know, doing it then and doing it now, what what do you think uh, you found that's different? Well, obviously, we have a better understanding uh, when we started out, you know, of the whole MSERT process and the test requirements. Um, you know, we we knew we had a you know with eight gigahertz radar, we had a, a potential game changer. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the overall measurement performance, the ease of installation and functionality. But what was different? Um, I suppose the constraints of COVID um, were the biggest difference this time around. Um, you know, for example, you know, manufacturing audits and certain, certain witness testing had to be done via a conference call. Uh, also, you know, video and photographic recordings were required for, for other tests, you know, that perhaps pre-COVID would have just been witnessed at the factory. So those are some of the differences. Um, having said that, you know, the, the, the conference calls, you know, we used to good effect both internally and externally, you know, to discuss and solve problems uh, more quickly, actually. Um, also, you know, this time we decided to engage WRC at Swindon 
uh, to carry out the field test element of the MSERT certification. So we utilise their dedicated test rig. Mm. I think it's a really interesting point about sort of you, audits that would normally take uh, place in person and people adapting to technology and sort of allowing these processes to continue in, in sort of in today's uh, challenging world. So, you know, I think it's great to see people adapting for that. I mean, in, in uh, one of your previous answers, you were talking about um, radars and controllers um, as part of this uh, latest MSERT certificate. That's right, yeah. How difficult was it um, putting multiple radars and controllers through uh, the process all at once? Yeah, I, think, I, think, I suppose, yeah, it wasn't more difficult. It just took a lot longer, Matt. I mean, that's the, the bottom line. Um, you know, for example, you know, the accuracy and repeatability tests were carried out on the Vega calibration test rig at the factory uh, for each type of radar. So, you know, one you know, radar with a cable version and also the compact version with the display. Um, also, you know, additional temperature and humidity tests were undertaken because of the way, um, you know, because of the number of instruments that were there. So it's, you know, not so much more difficult, but essentially there was a lot more data that had to be handled, more calculations had to be made, uh, and then the results had to be presented in a, as clear a format as possible, really to make the task of certification uh, easier for the committee. Yeah, and I suppose that's something that, that's, that's very different this time around, isn't it? Because historically, those flow, flow calculations have been done in the, you know, the box on the wall, you know, the flow computer itself. Mm -hmm. So as a user, what options do you have then with our, with our latest systems? Okay, so we have four uh, different types of radar sensor available as standalone open channel flow transmitters. Uh, and each of those uh, will give you flow rate. Uh, it's available as a simple analog 40 to 20 milliamp signal or as a, a digital heart seven signal. Uh, and of course, the digital heart seven gives you additional data uh, that can be read by you know, a suitable data log or a remote telemetry unit. For example, you know, the heart seven signal will give you flow rate, uh, level height, measurement reliability, you know, and measurement reliability is a useful diagnostic parameter uh, showing the quality of the radar echo as it's reflected off uh, the water of the, of the, uh, of the open channel flow uh, primary device. So you know, a lot, lot more information and options. So once you've got the, 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 the radar devices, we, you know, in standalone form, uh, we also have dual channel as well as single channel controllers. Uh, that will give you totalization options, data logging and backup. Yeah. Uh, but as I said, really, it's, it's all about flexibility is key in this one, either a standalone or you know, with a controller. Yeah, and I think that, that what you talk about with the heart communication and getting more data from a smart sensor, that, that smart, uh, that data is, is still in that radar, whether you take it out or not. And using Absolutely. heart to get, to get that data out, you know, whether it's, you know, temperature, uh, measurement reliability, as you say, is something that we, we've worked with customers on, uh, you know, at the moment. And it's getting that data out, smart water, um, you know, it's, it's such a hot topic these days. I think it's Absolutely. a really interesting move to, to be able to do that with this, with this latest range. Um, I just have one more question for you. And that was really just about, you know, what do you feel like you learned um, from going through this process? That's a good question, Matt. Uh, you know, as I say, every day is a school day, isn't it? Um, I suppose not so much learning completely new things, uh, but having things confirmed. Um, one thing that came out of it was, you know, just confirmation of the accuracy of, the, of these radars when they they were on the calibration test rig. You know, it, the accuracy was superb. Um, the importance of good data handling and the clear presentation of the results, you know, that was pretty well key. Um, yeah, what do we learn? You know, always question and double check. Um, but yeah, it was an interesting process for sure. Um, yeah. I was thinking, you know, perhaps we can take a look at the, you know, a few photographs of the test facilities. We yeah, test facilities we use, Matt. Yeah, um, if I if I can share the screen, that would be. You've got them there, Peter. Please feel free to share them. Yeah, <laughs> we'll do one. Just one second. Okay. 
right. Can you see that, Matt? It is there now. Yes. So you can Excellent. explain to me what we're actually looking at here. Okay. So this is our cal calibration test rig uh, at Schiltach in the Black Forest of Germany. Uh, you can see um, at, on the top left this sun shaped target. Uh, this is used to give an optimum reflection of the transmitted signal. Uh, the target moves on a special track with a stepper motor, and the distance is measured using a laser interferometer. Uh, on the right here, you can see the anechoic uh, material inside that test rig. And down the bottom here, you can see two of the, the instruments that were tested uh, during the MSERTS, MSERTS process. So on the left-hand side is uh, a Vega Pulse C21, and on the right-hand side is a Vega Pulse 31. So these, these are <coughs> the, the photographs at the bottom uh, were during the process of doing the MSERTs this time around. Um, the next photograph I have to show you, this is a specialist climate chamber for the temperature and humidity tests. And you can see two radars at the top of this rig here uh, being aimed at a target down the bottom. Uh, and you can see them a bit closer on the right hand side here. And also at the bottom, there's a controller uh, in, a, in another climate chamber. Uh, so these these were the temperature and humidity tests that were carried out for for, for MSERS this time around. It's uh, it's great to actually see some photographs of behind the scenes, and you know we we all get to see the certificate as the end product, but it's not that often that we get an opportunity to to sort of see some of the test rigs that are used uh, during this process, whether that's the humidity testing or or the accuracy testing. So so thank you very much for that uh, you, fantastic. Matt little insight there Peter and for, for taking the time to, to answer these questions for us today as part of uh, this MSERT class one product launch so thanks very much Peter. Thank you Matt take care cheers. You too bye bye. So that brings uh, to a close the pre-recorded videos um, from us um, hopefully you found that informative and interesting um, as I said we wanted to try and do something different rather than prevent, presenting just over a few slides. So hopefully uh, the information came across um, and was interesting. Um, there is going to be further online webinars, um, technical presentations and training seminars down here uh, at the office for those that want to get really into the detail of the new systems, how we use Bluetooth. But um, from now on, me and Pete are here to do a Q&A with Oliver and with anyone that's got any questions and wants to know a little bit more about what we're presenting about today. So thank you, Matt. Thank you, Pete. Um, if anyone wants to ask a question, we can unmute, I believe, people, but also do, do feel free to um, ask questions in the chat and I will um, read them out. I, for me, I've, several things come to mind. Love the uh, innovation on, on the color changing. Uh, I think on site with, with the red, amber, green, uh, on the display, to my mind, actually some of it's really there to help the environment agency. So the six pin allowing you into sort of level one, allowing you to view things and then a level two to change things. Yeah. So that was, to me, that's quite interesting because of course, if you haven't got a display on site, it, it's part of the MSERT's requirement to have that, have a, some way of somebody saying, Bluetooth on a mobile phone, great. But even if you do have the display, red, amber, green, tell somebody very quickly that something's going on. And obviously from the agency point of view, if it's not, oh, sorry, from the operator's point of view, if it's not overflowing, sorry, if it's overflowing and it's not raining when they're on site and they've suddenly got this thing flashing red in the background, they're going to go, something's wrong here. <laughs> so that's quite, an, a, it's quite interesting to do that visualization piece from a site level which is which is really really great to do um also for me it was great to have an insight um on mserts i've over the years i've had a lot of people approach me and say oliver this mserts how do we get things past certification and i, I remember talking to you all back in 2016 um so Really, it's interesting to see once you've done it once, Pete, 
Yeah. The the what what you've had to give the was it easy any easier second time round or? I think that our understanding was easier. But as I said uh, in the interview, there was lots to do. There's a lot to do, yeah. But but no, it's clearly once once you understand the process, things get a lot easier. Clearly. Yeah, it's it's I, it was interesting doing all the lab testing in Shieldtack, and I, I certainly I remember when visiting Shieldtack. You'll be able to tell me how long ago, Matt. I'm sure. Um, um, more, yeah, I don't know, about four or five years ago. Yeah, too too long now, I think. Um, but um, I, I remember seeing some of the elements, and it, it certainly it's certainly well worth a visit when when we can through COVID because. Um, I remember certainly seeing all the chip floor and all, all the all the chips going together and that stuck out in my head. Um, down yeah, to some... I was just, sorry, I was just going to say on, on that, yeah, um, with, with the microwave chip and things like that, and you, you mentioned before, you know, we, we did bring a, a radar system to the market, you know, quite a few years ago, but I think that the timing now and the product now is so much more yeah. fitting. Um, and that's mainly down to the fact that the radar microwave chip we do in-house um, yeah. so much better control over the components the component costs um, the time scales of getting the, the units manufactured and out on time and I think without that then then we certainly would have struggled to be as competitive as we are now because you rightly said at the beginning that really uh, you could fit a bit of tracing paper probably between the, the pricing now of a radar and uh, sort of more traditional technologies in the market. So, so yeah, I think it's a really exciting time for radar because um, I think some people still kind of see it as, oh, well, I, I don't need something as advanced as a radar. Um, but I think people are much more as accepting in it now because of the benefits it brings for the price point. So I think those are, those are some pretty interesting points. Well, I must admit the, the, the dual tra channel um, controller was interesting for me because obviously with UMON 3, UMON 4 at the minute, you're going to see people putting in a UMON 3, UMON 4 device on, on that front end of the treatment works and even with an EDM device as well, potentially. So it, it's interesting to have that all. You could almost have your local panel uh, in, a, in a box on site. Um, so everything's there. So really, agency operator can just walk straight up to that. Five, me five meter range obviously means if it's a particularly deep application, you can just cite it at the top. Yeah. And of course, that, that ac accuracy doesn't matter what range it's at, does it? Correct. Correct. And, and that's, that's one of the things that we think, you know, when people say, well, what really is the difference? These are ready to rock and roll as soon as they come out the box. We don't have to have them shipped with another component or part that, that makes them accurate enough to do the job. These are ready to rock and roll, whether you've got the controller or not. Um, just on the color changing display, you've got up to five different um, color changing options. You can set them to whatever color you want. Uh, when I say that, yeah, it is literally whatever color you want. Um, you can have them whether they flash or whether they're just a static changing color. So it, it's just making things more visible and much, much easier for people to see when they are on site. Um, so yeah, it, there's there's lots of different innovations that keep coming, which is really really nice. It's just uh, it's great using platforms like this to try and get um, some of those innovations and some of those new features out there with the benefits during such a weird times like COVID. To be honest, no, definitely. So hopefully everyone who's here has got questions and do potential questions to answer. Do put them in the chat or. I presume put your hand up. Uh, I don't know if you can do that, Zim, but do answer things in the chat or do say if you want to come on stage and ask some questions. Um, other than that, I will just keep rambling on. Um, well, a question for me really is, you know, we, I've been on lots of different seminars and stuff, Oliver. Where, where do you think um, the industry is with, you know, all these new points, UMON 3 installs and people want to future proof? Um, their measurement points. People are talking about using switches, people are talking about using continuous level devices. We've worked with major water companies that want to future-proof by using radar. So it doesn't matter what that standard is at the end of, end of this process with the product and the installation guidelines, they've gone, well, we use a radar, it's too mal accurate. Um, you know, pretty much irrespective of how that guideline comes out, we should be good and ready to rock and roll 
that you know us as a supplier might need to do something to, to cover that UMON3. But what do you think? Um, what's your sort of viewpoint on on that at the moment? I, I suppose um, there's the several points to make. Really, I mean, UMON3 probably the better the accuracy, the less callouts you're going to get. So the less false alarms you're going to get, the less things you're going to have to explain. Uh, and let me go into that in a little bit more depth. Uh, yes, the we've all seen the draft UMON3 standard and we will see that it's not out just yet. And yes, a uh, sort of level probe is in there, is allowed. Really, I don't think it's going to, uh, level probe's not to cut the mustard. And although it's in that standard, really, a, a company's got to be looking at some sort of level device. Um, mm. That's actually going to help you a lot more in understanding the way the works is performing. Moving forward, and I'm going to come outside of the UMON3. Actually, a, when they first did M certs back in 2005 uh, to 2010, you had this regulatory device. You had to put it in. UMON4, UMON3, we have to put it in. The EDMs, we had to put it in. But what we didn't think is what more can we do with that data? Yeah. Um, and actually, when it came to total daily volume, DWF certs. There was a lot we could do. We could do it for pollution detection. We could do a lot more with it. As we move towards a system approach, there's a lot more you can do with that data. So a lot of people started talking about digital twins. Is that going to happen? Potentially. Is our smart wastewater networks going to happen? Potentially. Uh, some of the learning from where, where it's been delivered internationally has been, well, actually, is you need that level of accuracy. You need to know that level of uncertainty on, on your measurement point. Well, in some ways in the UK, we've got that benefit. Um, we've got that benefit that we'll know the uncertainty because, hey, we're getting this MSERTS approved. So everyone thinks of MSERTS as something that's very costly, and it is to a certain extent, but it's got a lot of benefits to the way the industry operates as well. Um, and arguably, I know we're talking about radar today, but that could be any level device, to be fair. Um, but actually, my challenge to you in 2016, why would I, I, why would I buy a radar? The challenge I'd expect back to you, back from you now is, done that, why would you buy an ultrasonic? Well, and that's contentious, and I know that's yeah. contentious, but five meter range, two mil accuracy, proofs in the pudding. Yeah, and I think- or, or we could say, why wouldn't you buy radar? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And yes. It's interesting, I, I've been in various meetings where people have said, we would have the radar there as our get out of jail free card, if the other things, you know, that we typically use um, aren't suitable or can't be mounted in the right place because they're measuring range or whatever it might be. And somebody that might be on this call turned around and said, well, why would you have those? In, in your uh, sort of, as an option, if the radar is what gets you out of trouble and is now cost effective. So it's kind of like, and I think people are coming around to that leading, why do not start with a radar as your measurement um, technology? Because you know, it covers more, more applications than any other technology in the market, um, hands down. Well, I mean, six years ago, to be fair, Matt, it wasn't cost effective. No. Now, it definitely is. Yeah, I mean, depending on the application area, you 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 could make a case for it, with, certainly. But but certainly now it is very very different in terms of uh, the entry level radar costs and sort of the benefits that it brings, especially on chemical measurement and things like that through through plastic tank routes, which you obviously can't do with any other um, technology. So so yeah, I think that it's it's certainly proving its worth. Yeah, it, it's a challenge that I. Mean, I've seen lots of contact probes put into ferric sulfate and ferric chloride tanks, and they've dissolved within six months. Um, of course, the advantage, as I said, with radars, you can, you can mount it outside and see through the tank. Um, and I, I remember all your demonstrations with Nutella, 
that I've certainly seen o- over the years. Yes. And yeah, it, it, it proves its accuracy, especially to save chemicals. Yeah. Um, and then that feeds back to um, feeds back to whatever system. On that, so your output at the minute is analog or, or heart-based output. Right. Are there any other communication protocols? I know some of the water companies will use Profibus. Not currently. No. Not currently. Is that so, uh, something that may be developed in the future, I suppose, if there's the market? Yeah, I think, um, you know, we've got pulse outputs. Um, we've got the, um, you know, retransmission of 420s at the moment. Depending on where the devices are going, and if they do, if we need to get into coffee bus gateways, heart gateways, whatever that might be, um, then there's, you know, there's different routes that we can look down. Um, and, you know, we are in discussions with, with our colleagues in Germany and product management about what the market wants, you know, and we welcome anyone that wants to come and talk to us about, you know, what they really need from, uh, from devices out in the field, because, you know, once we know about them, um, we can obviously put things into action, to try and do something about it. So, so yeah, we certainly welcome interacting with people about, about what the market wants. What's your view on, on the profit bus side of it, just out of interest? I, it, it's not, it's not the fact that my view, I, I, I know that some companies use Profibus and they'll go, no, we want Profibus. No, we want Profibus. No, we want Profibus. So I know some will, will ask for it yeah. um, and they'll preferentially go for that, that, that sort of system because that's what they need to communicate with. So it, it, it was just a, that it's that sort of case that it's something, but I, I suppose if there's that market there for, for it, then, of course. Yeah, I think the thing is with a lot of um, sort of process instrumentation for wiring and the benefits of profit bus that you get over that, um, you know, we've got a full range of, of kit that, that can do those um, different outputs. But um, I've asked various people in the industry as well, you know, whether it's in, in if it's profit bus, if it's on a, you know, an isolated site into an outstation or whatever it might be, if you're not utilizing the additional data that you're yeah. getting from profit bus. Agreed. And, yeah. It's kind of like, why, why would you want to go down that route? It makes swap outs really difficult and hot swap in sort of late at night for, for a different kit and GSD files and old kit, new kit. So it introduces quite a lot of um, challenges, I know, for some of the major water companies anyway. Um, so I think um, if we need to do it, you know, it's something that we can certainly look at. Yeah. I'm, so my last question before hopefully people will, will ask, ask some questions. You mentioned um, you can loop power uh, in, into a battery outstation. What's the sort of power drain on that? I, I, I know it's asking how long's a piece of string because it depends upon the size of the battery. Yeah. Um, well, but we, we're potentially using heart, so that's running on four milliamps. Yeah. And you're starting at 12 volts, so that's, there's your answer, really. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, with, with some of that stuff, you know, we've got stuff that's been out in the field working for five or six years on, on uh, battery powered telemetry systems. Um, and like Peter says, on a, you know, in heart multi drop mode, you're drawing four milliamps. Um, you're looking at around a 12, 15 second start up when you're in heart multi drop mode. So you're talking about such a small draw um, actually on, on the battery each time, obviously depending on the intervals. But, you know, it's certainly competing with the existing um, sort of battery consumption that, that is being used in the market. Um, pressure transmitters that are being used on telemetry, you know, the pressure's there as soon as they're woken up. But with these sort of devices, you know, we've got to build an echo curve and filtering and stuff. So, I mean, within that 12 seconds, it's pretty quick. So, um, yeah, no, it, I, I know. I mean, having worked for for several water companies, I know we do have a lot of some some sites are on are on zero power, so they are on batteries um, to do it. And it, it's a case of you're always scratching your head. Well, I, am I going to have to go out every every year or every two years to replace that battery? And when's that battery going to going to fail? And uh, and etc. So having that power ability to have a level. Tr- transmitter on on battery power is in, incredibly powerful obviously not having the transmitter there is another thing that that helps a great deal yeah. uh having not having the controller there so it, it really does help a lot to have a battery solution um yeah. 
which is which is great. So unless there are some questions from the audience, normally I can draw out at least one question. Uh, one from Lee Upton. Could we, could it be solar powered for rural applications? For rural applications, then yeah, not only why not. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we, we've had some stuff over the years um, on on our previous generation of low cost radar, which wasn't as low cost as this one, <laughs> and it was a bit bigger and it was a bit more power hungry, and it took longer to start up. You know, where people use sort of um, small small little um, sort of, uh, wind power generating and solar powered systems for um, for road signs and things like that, flooding that sort of thing, and we've done that sort of stuff in the past. So there's absolutely no reason we can't do it and we also have got um solar power system in our range as well so yeah if there's really remote stuff that needs doing um then by all means get in touch with us yeah i remember your solar power system it's a sort of um level meter on a stick type thing and it was it was very neat uh because you also had um a gsm gprs um connection on that as well didn't you if i remember correctly that's right yeah so, and if I remember correctly, that was used quite a lot by roads, the road in, road industry. Oh, yeah, remote sites. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, remote yeah. Sites, yeah. yeah. A, lot of, a lot of that sort of technology was initially sort of developed for infantry monitoring and that sort of thing. Um, so longer um, start, you know, longer measuring intervals, if you like, um, a few times a day rather than some of the... Yeah. The requirements of the water industry, you know, where they're looking at 15 minute in measurement intervals, that sort of thing. So, yeah, I mean, in yeah. some places it's it's going down, unfortunately, going down to two minutes so uh, nowadays. So, yeah, it's two minute intervals with a seven year battery life. Yeah, <laughs> that would be lovely. I think <laughs> I think quite a lot of people would take you up on that, Matt. I was just I was just stating what I'd heard, so I'm like, <laughs> not what I've got. <laughs> so. <laughs> So unless there are any questions for the audience, and I'll give everyone about a minute or two, I will say thank you very much, Matt. Thank you very much, Pete. Thank you very, uh, much. Thank you very much, Doug, in the background, who's been handling all the technology. Um, is there any way people can get in touch with you if they have some burning questions, Matt? Yes, there is. Doug is going to put my contact details into the chat now. Um, and um, obviously we're, we're aware of the people that have signed up for today. Um, there will, as you've already said, there will be a uh, recording of this that's made available. Um, and we are, you know, this is our initial product launch just to make people aware of the product and the features and some of the main benefits that around the difference of what we're trying to uh, put into the market. There will be technical webinars and presentations and training sessions that are going to follow. So this wasn't obviously designed to be sort of really in-depth technical. It's more just to sort of making people aware. And we hope that it's it's opened people's eyes to maybe something different um, to what they're used to using in the market and maybe getting in touch with us so that we can we can put some trials out there and prove the technology really. And to talk talk with my Swig hat, I know Swig are looking for training videos um, to help the industry at the minute. So I'm I'm sure you're going to be in touch with Rosa to sort that out. Yes, um, we were meant to host the, the EDM and um, flow um, session in March at this very building. Um, and unfortunately, you know, it went online, but understandably, but hopefully we can we can host something late in the year or, or beginning of next. Mm -hmm. cer certainly at WEM this year, we're hoping to um, potentially have uh, with WEM virtual potentially have some training videos etc uh, and potentially have the learning the learning zone um, in, a, in a web format as well so that's yeah. something to look look forward to um, so anyone who's not aware of WEM, then please please do come uh, virtual this year so no travel no travel required so thank you very much for today Matt thank you very much Pete Doug um, lovely to see at least very briefly your your the new vega premises Indeed. and um we will catch up with you again soon Excellent. thanks amber sorry amber uh, indeed indeed and thanks for uh 
thanks for hosting and uh thanks for a pleasure today. and uh, thank you again for everybody that, that's come along today if you have got any questions please do get in touch with us and uh yeah hopefully we'll catch up with you soon maybe even in person who knows yeah thanks everybody. hopefully very soon thanks matt thanks, thanks pete thanks, yeah. Doug. cheers bye-bye